what this marketing is really doing is kind of tapping into those of us who are just looking for the next best thing, for n- looking for the, 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 the next library that we hope is going to be the thing that unlocks our career goals. And I've talked about that on the channel before. That, my friends, is not true. No one library, no matter how multi-sampled, no matter how many hours of editing, no matter how many gigabytes they throw at you, no one library is going to unlock your career. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, a weekly podcast dedicated to all things production and library music, where we talk about industry topics and take deep dives into the different aspects of being a working production music composer. If this is your first time here, welcome, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the audio on the go, I just wanna thank you for spending part of your day here with me today. And please note that it's my sincere hope that you'll be able to take away a little something to help grow your career in the production music industry. Today's episode is made possible thanks to the support of the family, friends, and patrons subscribers of 52Qs who really help keep all of this happening. We are 100% community supported, so you're not gonna hear any embedded sponsored ads, but if you wanna learn more about how you can help support 52Qs while also unlocking exclusive subscriber perks like live streams, workshops, Zoom coaching sessions, library briefs, and a ton more, then be sure to click on the links in the description for more information. So today, I want to take a few minutes to talk about Spitfire audio. And before we get started, I I want to say that that I don't mean this to come off super ranty and this isn't a clickbait thing, but because at the end of the day, I, I really like Spitfire. They're one of my favorite companies. I have, you know, terabytes of their product on my hard drive. I use Spitfire quite frequently. I've mentioned that Christian Henson is a big influence on me as a YouTuber, and I like what he's about and all of that. And I know there was a ton of drama with Christian Henson and Spitfire, and I'm not going to even attempt to touch that with a 10-foot pole. But I feel like lately they've kind of lost their way. And so while on one hand, I feel like if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And we try to keep things super positive here on the channel. But with someone who has invested a lot of money with their products, who believe in the company and recognize that they employ hundreds of people, whether it's the staff, whether it's the composers who work who work with them, whether it's the folks that they pay royalties to for their libraries. I mean, that alone is so forward thinking and so outside the box thinking that I have a ton of respect for them. And if you didn't know that, my understanding is, is that Spitfire pays royalties to the performers in their libraries. So when they bring a string player in or or an orchestra or whatever, they are cutting in those players into the sales. That's huge. And to my knowledge, they are one of, if not the only company to do that. So I love what Spitfire is about. I love their user interface and they make a lot of products that cover a really wide range of applications. But I feel they've lost their way a little bit. And I felt these rumblings about four years ago, four or five years ago, whenever BBCSO came out. And we started to get this trickle of marketing that, that's kind of the, the J.J. Abrams mystery box marketing where they would tease a little something and something which is so amazing is about to redefine music, redefine sample making. And for me, it kind of started with that BBCSO trailer.
Now, I'm not going to lie. This got me unbelievably hype for BBCSO. Like, hi, I, I bought it. I was uh, an early adopter. I bought it uh, right right out of the gate. I, I got the full version before there was a core and a discovery, you know, the free version and all of that. I, I, I went all in on BBCSO. But this kind of mystery box marketing, I was like, hmm, you know, something's coming. They had a live event that they that they did uh, where they revealed it and they talked about it. It was like Christian and Paul kind of doing their thing. It was super, super cool. And I was like, all right, this is this is the the new flagship that they're that they're going to be working with. And I was like all on board. But then some other things started coming out. And BBSO, once the kind of the hype died and once things were released, then I felt like, okay, now now there's like kind of Albion Neo. Well, 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 that's 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 the new best amazing thing. And then Abbey Road won. Well, no, no, now that's the new best thing. And then the the latest, the <laughs> the thing that triggered this whole video and where I'm like, okay, all right, Spitfire, we need to. You okay over there? You're, you are you all right? Because not only and what I'm talking, I'm, I'm talking about Abbey Road Orchestra first violins. Now, some of the things that that or some of the claims that were made in the uh, in the BBCSO trailer, you know, a a new standard, a new standard in uh, orchestral composition. I mean, these these are these are very brave brave terms, bold claims, world class orchestra plugin. Yes, okay, this their 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 user interface is is brilliant, uh, and it was like I said, I I was hype, and I was ready to go. But this uh, the latest, and and I want to pay play a little bit of this, the trailer for their latest plugin which is the Abbey Road First Violins. So there, there's no doubt that hundreds and hundreds of hours, well, they, they said like, what, 2,000 hours went into this. And I believe that Abbey Road Orchestra First Violins is probably the most detailed, most advanced string library currently on the market. That's just, I, I by the way, I haven't used it. I have BBCSO. I love it. It's, it's not it's not without its issues, and we'll talk about that a little bit here later. But considering the amount of options you get with this library, the amount of detail, the forensic level of programming that you can do with this library, I th- I think is arguably unparalleled. However, is it like the most amazing thing? Is it going to dramatically improve your life as a composer? I don't know. Their marketing would, would tell me that. And Spitfire's marketing team is on point. They are great. That trailer gets me hype. I'm like, okay, then maybe maybe I do need you know, maybe I do need this product. And so I, I, 
I started out by saying I like Spitfire as a company. This is not a slam on them as a company. I want to play a little bit more from the trailer going into Paul's walkthrough a little bit with some, some demos right out of the gate. Hi, now, Paul Thompson here from Spitfire Audio. Now, now that sounds good. It sounds good. And I, I recognize all the work that went, went into it. All the mic positions, all the legato transitions, everything that went into it. So I just want to commend Spitfire for the work that's gone into this. If I'm being honest, if I can just be honest... What I that little demo I just heard didn't like completely blow me away, which is fine. It's it's MIDI. There are just fundamental limitations on what MIDI software can do. And so I was willing to be like, okay, all right, this is this is what it is. So very cool. First violins. It wasn't until I saw this. Four 49. And that stopped me dead in my tracks. And at that point, I went from, okay, kind of mystery box marketing to this is the next best thing. They're, 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 they're marketing their products. I totally get it. It's what they do. You know, when you, you know, they, 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 advertise their products the same way a, a movie advertises their product. I get it. I understand it. It's not my favorite thing. And I have largely managed to uh, step back from the the FOMO factor that, that I think Spitfire kind of preys on a little bit, but I think that's just a marketing thing. But as soon as, as you come at me with and for you audio folks, a $450 price tag for just the first violins, I think we got problems. Because what I just heard, and in some of the other demos, and there are plenty of demos on YouTube that you can check out. Many of them were either sponsored or the composers got the library for free. And I am, I am someone who has gotten stuff for free. And while yes, you're not being compensated to, uh, to say one thing, one or the other, but chances are, if, if they're giving it for free, you're already probably a fan and you're probably pre, uh, inclined to kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. But, 450 bucks for the first violins, just one section. And that demo from Paul, I'm sorry to say, and I mean absolutely no disrespect, I say this with love as somebody who really, really loves Spitfire, that demo did not blow me away. That was literally the first I heard of that library. And I've heard some other things which sound pretty decent. But that's the thing. If we were to extrapolate the, the, the cost, so let's do some napkin math here. Let's say the first violins are $450. And I know they were on sale. I know there's educational discounts, but this is a suggested retail price. Five string sections, if we did first violins, second violins, violas, cellos, and basses. Do basses need that depth? Probably not. But let's just napkin math. The Just the string section alone would be over $2,200. Okay. What about brass? What 
So let's put all the trumpets together, all the horns together, trombones, and tuba. So that would be almost $1,800. Let's look at the woodwinds. Flute, clarinet. Let's put, let's put oboe and English horn together and bassoon. Again, another $1,800. Bucks. Now, now let's look at the percussion. Let's put all of the battery percussion together. So that would be your snare drums, your gran casa, your uh, piatti, all of the, let's put all of the non-pitched percussion together. Let's put all of the pitched percussion together. So crotales, vibraphone, glockenspiel, marimba, tubular bells, let's put all of those together. And now let's put the timpani together. That would be $1,300 over that. Which brings the cost for the entire orchestra, if we were just to extrapolate, and, and to be fair, they've made zero announcement. They, we don't know the prices. I am just extrapolating using napkin math. We are looking at almost $7,200 for the orchestra. Now, I think they would be out of their bleeping mind to release in this market a $7,000 plug-in. I, I think sample libraries have come a long way and they are making great strides. SoundPaint, as of this recording, just a couple of weeks ago, released Ad Astra and it sounds really amazing. And it's, what, $100? Can Ad Astra do what Abbey Road first violins does absolutely not it's not trying to be but $99 versus $2,000 if we're if we're staying to the strings which begs the question who is this for who is Abbey Road Orchestra first violins for if we're spending $450 for just the first violins, not all the strings. 450 for just the strings, that would be pretty steep, but so who is this for? Well, is it for trailer composers? I don't think so. I don't think trailer composers need the forensic level of detail that you would use to really get the most out of this library. I don't think trailer composers are going to do that. I don't think us production music composers, this is the wrong library for us. If you're a library production music composer, it's so much about being able to, to write quickly, it with quality, but write quickly. This is why, uh, and, and write a lot, right? Prolifically. This is why ensemble patches do, do us really, really well. Same for trailer folks. You know, trailer folks are like big, epic sounds. And so you're looking to, to layer, you know, three or four different string libraries on top of each other to, to give that epic sound. So uh, there are many better options for us production music composers than Abbey Road Orchestra First Violins. And again, it it sounds okay. Here is this, here's a trailer cue that uh, that they put up on the site here, and this is the the trailer music for the trailer itself. All right, so we've heard that. All right, here's another one. be noted that this cue also features Spitfire Harp, Intimate Grand Piano, and Abbey Road 1 Sparkling Woodwinds. All right, 
let's listen to another one. Now, now this, this demo is ambitious as hell. You know, Oliver Patrice uh, Vader, um, you know, he, he's on the channel. It's extremely gifted, extremely talented. But this is... All those runs are nearly impossible. And, and I say this with all the love and no disrespect to Mr. Vader here. Those string runs, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. They, 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 they betray the MIDI artifice that I don't really know of any library that could pull that off. Maybe this is the best that's out there right now and maybe I'm just being picky, and maybe I, I don't know, maybe I edit this out, whole part out. I probably won't. I mean, everything else sounds really, really good. Here's another demo. Yeah, the legatos and portamentos. That sounds good. It's it's like this this is st sticking to what MIDI can do well and what the library does well. The uh, the the previous with all those runs. I mean that's that is that is super courageous to put that out there. But I noticed it with Paul's demo, those fast runs. And, and, and here's the thing. At, at the end of the day, it doesn't feel like a $2,000 string library. Doesn't feel like it. Doesn't necessarily sound like it. So there's that. Who needs the forensic level of detail that this library, across like 16 different mic positions, who is really looking for it? The only thing that I can that I can guess would be mock-up composers or composers assistants. I think composers assistants are, are the real <laughs> the real market for this. Not me. I am not the target demographic for this. I am not the professional demographic. Who would who would get the most out of this? I am not the uh, the economic demographic. I don't have potentially seven thousand dollars to spend on a library, on a sample library. And if I did have seven thousand dollars to 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 pay for a sample library, then would I be would I be hiring string players anyway? But I think it's for composer assistants either working on lower budget productions, specifically films, because all, all, all of the examples that we've heard, they're all very cinematic. It's all very kind of classical. And I mean, classic, not classical, classic orchestration, classic orchestra applications. But the real question is, is, is a composer's assistant working up a mock-up that's eventually going to get re-recorded? And if that's the case, then are all of the, the, the levers and pulleys and bells and whistles that Abbey Road First Violins offers, is it worth not the financial investment, but the composer's assistant's time, the investment of paying somebody to make that as realistic as possible if the idea is being a mock-up, if it's going to get re-recorded. Or can you use something like 
Albion won, or even Abbey Road won. These libraries offer a ton of value for a fraction of the cost. So Abbey Road one is $449 for the entire orchestra recorded in the same space with admittedly significantly fewer options, whether it's mic positions, whether it's legato transitions, whatever. All of those things that make BB, uh, Abbey Road one first violins, all the things that make that separate, the Abbey Road orchestral foundations, all in one, that's an ensemble thing, it works. Even Albion one, for ensemble writing, which as of, the, as of this recording is also $450. But let's say you're a composer's assistant or you're even a production music composer like, like me and you need more detailed control over the parts of the orchestra. You don't need strings, you need first violin, second violin, viola, and all of that kind of thing then BBCSO, I think, is, as this ad says, a gold standard. Now, it, as a time of this writing, is a thousand bucks. I didn't pay a thousand dollars for it, but I did pay seven hundred dollars for it. And it's huge. I literally had to buy a new hard drive <laughs> to, uh, to hold it. And as I mentioned, it's not without its problems. It's pretty CPU hungry. It chews up RAM faster than any other contact library I've ever used. Uh, and it's not a contact library. It's its own plugin, which gets better and better over time. They have improved it. When we first got it, when I first got it, rather, the bassoons were terrible, did, did not like the bassoons at all. And the horns were blah, but they've improved those things. They've cleaned them up. But when I need split string sections, I absolutely reach for BBCSO. I have zero buyer's remorse getting BBCSO. And I can't, because I'm I'm not a composer's assistant, I don't do mock-ups, like detailed mock-ups that need to go, you know, sit in 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 a in a meeting and, and be played in a meeting with the likes of like Kevin Feige or Steven Spielberg or whatever, right? I I do not swim in those deep waters. I don't, admittedly. But the level of detail that BBCSO offers as a production music composer is more than I will ever use. And not, not to mention all of the exhaustive mic positions. Like, too much. <laughs> you gave me too much of a good thing here. I've gone in, I've, I, I've spent some time tweaking the mic positions I, I like, you know, this much of the tree, this much of the outrigger, this much of the stereo, this much of the close, right? And it's like four different mic positions that I kind of mix. And that's it. That's what I use pretty much for everything these days. Now, personally, I like the sound of the BBCSO library better. The Abbey Road, for me, the room is just kind of... Or maybe it's the room, maybe it's the way they recorded it. And again, I mean, no disrespect to anybody involved. I know thousands of hours went into this and I get it. I'm not the target demographic, but I, I'm just going to respond to it because as a person in the industry, talking to folks who, are, who feel kind of tugged and pulled into these different sales and marketing and everything. So for me, the, the Abbey Road room itself, I, I'm not, it's not my favorite much more like Air Studios. I like Air Studios and the BBCSO room. I forget what the actual name of the room is. Uh, I, yeah, it's got a, it's got kind of an unusual name uh, to it. And my apologies for, for not remembering what the, oh, uh, Made of Vale Studios. Been, been in business since uh, 1909. Anyway, uh, I like the sound of that. And I feel like I can work it with other reverbs and everything. Whereas with Abbey Road, I, I feel like I'm kind of stuck into that if I, if I were to get it. So I think while this 
uh, Abbey Road One First Violins isn't for me from a usage perspective. It's certainly not for me from a cost perspective. Beyond all of that, where I wish that Spitfire would return to was whatever, whatever kind of sparkly alchemy was happening when evolutions were like front and center. Forward thinking, really somewhat experimental, modern production, modern film music, modern music for media scoring, modern tools. And Abbey Road Orchestra First Violins, to me, feels like a step backwards. I listen to these amazing demos and maybe maybe I'm just so far removed from that scene that this it doesn't necessarily feel like the type of music that I am hearing whether it's film, TV or whatever. It doesn't feel like that. And I've felt that Perhaps Spitfire is kind of retreading very familiar ground because they're exceedingly good at it. They're good at recording. They're good at sample manipulation. They're, they're good at programming. I mean, they created their own plugin, which is pretty darn stable, if you ask me. Again, not without its problems, but all things considered, it's pretty dang good. I think uh, East West could take some notes. But it's not the most forward-looking thing. A few months ago, BBCSO Pianos came out. And I had the very similar questions like, who is this for? Who's looking for this? And as a BBCSO owner, I was like, why didn't you just include that? <laughs> but to be honest, I don't need another piano. Does the market need another piano? Does the market need another string library, which is just straight down the middle and not bringing much new to the table for the mass audience, the mass consumer of their sample libraries? I don't know. I think maybe not. Maybe I'm just not the target demo. And so because I'm not a composer's assistant, because I don't work you know, in LA, I don't work on that level, maybe I just don't get it. You know, it's kind of like watching a show uh, and it's it's in a foreign language and you're like, I, I don't understand. Something's getting lost in trip. Maybe Maybe it's just that. But on the other hand, they've already they've they've re also released a core version of first violins. That's two forty nine, so that's two hundred fifty bucks. So I'm like, okay, all right. So that's a little bit a little bit more palatable, even though if you extrapolate the entire library, you're still looking at four thousand dollars nearly. But we don't know that math if that math is accurate. But the core version only has one mic position. You have one mic position. You have most of the articulations, but not all of the articulations. So for 250 bucks, which is a quarter of the price of BBCSO, you can get one string section with one mic position and a handful of articulations. Or you can pay four times that, get $1,000. Now you have BBCSO with exhaustive mic positions and most of the articulations I can imagine you ever needing. So I applaud Spitfire for going this direction. I uh, let me let me say that again. I applaud Spitfire for the ambitiousness of this project. I applaud them. But I also want to return to the Spitfire that was really, really pushing into new territory. The evolutions, that feels like modern 
modern scoring tools, the Oliver Arnold stuff. I, I was, I, I really, really like that. But for the last several years, maybe it's COVID restrictions or, or the limitations of, of you know, a, a pandemic and a post-pandemic world. I, I, don't, I don't know. But I just feel that Spitfire has somewhat lost their way, retreading very familiar ground, releasing products which are, I believe, well, I don't say products, this product, I, I believe the industry wasn't necessarily looking for and doesn't bring ultimately enough to the table to get to, to move the needle from a person like me. So that's what I think. What do you think? Have you picked up Abbey Road first violins? Have you used it? Am I totally off base? You know, if if you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If I am dead wrong and if you hate it and you're like, Dave, get over yourself, you're clearly not right, then 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 downvote the hell out of this video. But that's how that's how I'm feeling as a consumer, as a working professional composer, as an educator who talks to students all the time, whether they're working professionals or whether they're college students. We all subscribe to the same newsletters. We're all getting the same marketing. But I will say, if you are a production music composer, if that is your gig and that's what you're focusing on and that's what we hyper-focus on here, I strongly encourage you not to buy this first violin library. I don't believe what we write calls for the clinical forensic level of detail that this thing provides. It's way too expensive. And, and I'm at this point where it's at right now, I don't believe the the execution matches the price tag for us production music composers to make that investment. But I would love to hear from you and to hear your thoughts. So that's it. We've talked about Spitfire. If, you, if you're feeling like that whole FOMO thing, you know, uh, then I would encourage you to unsubscribe from these marketing emails. We're about to go into the Christmas shopping season as of this recording. You know, it's uh, the beginning of October as I'm recording this. We're about a month away from the absolute deluge blitzkrieg of Black Friday. And every company is going to be, you know, reaching their hand out, wanting you to, to, to buy something from them. And I get it. I, I totally get it. I mean, we're, 52Qs is a company. We have subscribers. I, I provide a service. I get money in exchange. So it's not about that. It's not about doing business. But if there's a part of you that feels like, oh, I've got to buy that next thing, then unsubscribe from, from the emails. Please do. I have. I've unsubscribed from Spitfire's list because it was triggering in me that FOMO response. And I went into that kind of anxiety mode. <laughs> because if that's you, then what this marketing is really doing is kind of tapping into those of us who are just looking for the next best thing, for looking for the, 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 the next library that we hope is going to be the thing that unlocks our career goals. And I've talked about that on the channel before. That, my friends, is not true. No one library, no matter how multi-sampled, no matter how many hours of editing, no matter how many gigabytes they throw at you. No one library is going to unlock your career. No library is going to be the key that is going to help you finally land a gig. 
no sample library is going to do that, regardless of whatever the marketing might say. And, you know, Spitfire isn't alone in this. I think they they are some of the, the, the leaders in this kind of marketing technique, kind of preying on, if you get this thing, now you'll be able to be successful. Now, to be fair, I don't think their marketing has ever come out and said that thing, but that's that's how I feel. And I've talked to many of you and I know exactly that's how you feel. But none of these libraries are going to do the work for you. Use what you have. Get good at writing. And then buy a library that fills a need. Don't buy a library because you think, Finally, it's it's going to help you succeed. Nope. That's that's between like you, your muse, your 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 drive, your dedication, your patience, your skills, skills with the DAW, skills with understanding orchestration and arrangement. That does so much more to help propel your career than any one sample library. So I just want to leave you with that. If you feel like the marketing is getting to you, then unsubscribe. Simple as that. But again, would love to hear from you. And I really do appreciate you sticking with me through this kind of quasi rant. Uh, So that's going to do it for me this week. And as always, a huge word of thanks to the family, friends, and patron subscribers of 52Qs who keep all of this going. If you want to join us, then head over to 52Qs.com. It is free to join the community, but we offer a ton of other subscriber perks. We have multiple levels. And coming up a little bit later, we are going to be adding a new subscriber tier to the 52Qs community uh, that is under. There's, uh, we have the free community, and then we have the friends and family, and we are adding a tier kind of right below friends there. But more information on that next time or, uh, or soon. Speaking of soon, you definitely want to tune in next week where I am going to be joined by a fellow uh, 52 Qs community member, Hans York, who's an amazing guitarist, an all around great guy, also works with uh, Jesse over at Sync My Music, and he sits down and talks about that, talks about his process, and so you don't want to miss my sit down with Hans York. But again, that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you've had an amazing week and I know, trust and believe friends that the universe has amazing plans just for you. Until next time, peace. The 52 Q's podcast is copyright 2023 818 studios, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used with permission and for educational purposes only. For more information and including joining the community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52 Q's.com. 